everybody and welcome to the Atheist Experience. I am your host Russell Glasser and with me today is Martin Wagner. Yellow. Uh, for those of you who are watching live and not on YouTube, you just saw a preview of the upcoming documentary from a couple of uh, German filmmakers. It's called Mission Control Texas and if you happen to be in Germany you can catch a screening of this uh, film live in uh, the next couple of weeks. It's going to be playing Tuesday, May 12th, and May uh, 17th, Sunday, uh, at the 30th International Documentary Film Festival in Munich. So uh, look nice. that up. And uh, Rolf, cool. if you're watching, I owe you a phone, uh, uh, and not a phone call, but a, an email <laughs> reply, and uh, so I will get that to you as soon as I can. But yeah. congratulations on, on finishing the film. I'm working hard on finishing mine, so I know how hard it is. Uh, for, and for people who are wondering if we'll be able to see it here in the United States, uh, almost certainly. <laughs> I don't have the inside track yeah. on that, but I'm sure it will be available and we'll let you know when it is. Exactly. Today is Sunday, May 10th, 2015. We're a live call-in public access TV show based in Austin, Texas, dedicated to promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. We're also available through live streaming video at ustream.tv. The official Atheist Experience website is www.atheist-experience.com. Uh, you can also provide feedback by commenting on the official show blog at freethoughtblogs.com slash AXP, or you can email us at tv at atheist-community.org. If you enjoy this show, please check out our related podcast, The Nonprofits, currently airing on the first and third Wednesdays of the month. You can find links at the Atheist Experience website, and the next nonprofits will be on in a couple of weeks. As always, the cast and crew of The Atheist Experience will be going to dinner after the show, at El Arroyo, 1624 West 5th Street. We'll arrive there around 6 p.m. Also, to all you, you mothers out there, happy Mother's Day. Yeah. And stuff. Everybody, <laughs> call your mothers, you ungrateful bastards. Yeah. Atheists have moms, too. That's true. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, special announcements. I just mentioned Mission Control Texas, which you mm -hmm. should check out. Um, I just came back last week from the uh, from Orange County, where I spoke at the OC Free Thought Alliance convention. Okay, uh, was a blast. I met Seth Andrews for the first time, who does the Thinking Atheist podcast. Uh, swell guy. Um, I also uh, hung out a little with Teresa McBain, who we've seen before in Austin, yeah. and her friend Sarah Moorhead, who are who both uh, have a lot to do with the organization of the reason rally now um, okay and they're both also uh, they've set up this thing called the hotline project which is actually really cool because uh, you know how people call into this show and they're like you know I've lost my faith and I don't know who to talk to and they talk to right. us but we only are on so many hours a week right uh, you can call this thing that they call the hotline project and I don't have a URL on me right now but uh, but you can probably Google it. And mm -hmm. uh, not only can you talk to people and get support, but you can also, by calling the hotline, volunteer and be one of those people who talks, who, who talks people down who have lost their faith recently. So that's pretty okay. cool. Uh, I'm also going to be in St. Louis in a couple of months for the Reason Rally, and so are Matt and Tracy. All right. Uh, so that's it for the announcements. Uh, and we have a topic today. <laughs> and we do indeed. Uh, I just happened to catch this thing this morning while I was going over my feeds. Uh -huh. um, it is a, a <laughs> typical, not at all clickbaity <laughs> headline <laughs> by Salon. <laughs> yeah, They're, they never do that sort of thing. Um, uh, and, and the headline is, New Atheism's Fatal Arrogance, the mm. Glaring Intellectual Laziness of Bill Maher and Richard Dawkins. Mm. Now, I read a headline like this, and I'm like, okay, sometimes Bill Maher and, and or Richard Dawkins may be intellectually lazy. I don't take everything they say as gospel. Let's see what this guy has to offer. Mm. And so I read it, and I was like, this guy has nothing at all to offer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll just read the beginning of it. 
yeah. uh, for starters. He says, atheism has a storied history in the West. From the irreverent Voltaire to the iconic Nietzsche, the godless have always had a voice. But the new atheists are different. Religion, they argue, isn't just wrong, it's positively corrosive. Uh -oh. If you've heard people like Bill Maher or Lawrence Krauss speak in recent years, you're familiar with this approach. Now, I'll just pause for a minute and ask, uh, religion, corrosive or not corrosive? Uh, pretty corrosive. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Okay. So, yeah, yeah fine so far. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, new atheism, by the way, I have never really heard anybody seriously say new atheism except people are, who are complaining about it. Yeah, when, it's one of those where the instant they, that, it, it, it's, it's one of those terms like social justice warrior. The minute yeah. you hear someone say it, you know that they're about to pretty much open up with both barrels Gripe and about air it. a bunch of whatever yeah. grievances that it, they It's have. like, I never considered atheism all that new. I was, you yeah. know, I, w I grew up as an atheist in the 70s, and, you know, Matt's a big fan of Robert Ingersoll, who mm -hmm. was, you know, quite the firebrand atheist like 100, 150 years ago, yeah. somewhere I mean, around there? Yeah, I the only thing that's really new about the new atheism is that it has actually been able to reach an audience. It has not right. had to suppress itself or hide or, you know, uh, be limited to fringe, cr people that get to appear on the media as fringe crazies, as, you know, the media always like to, you know, portray Madeleine O'Hare as, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, it's and been mainstreamed a bit more. So he well, goes, it. <laughs> so he goes on to say, um, new atheism emerged as a, in 2004 as a kind of literary and social movement led by such luminaries as Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, and Christopher Hitchens. New, atheists, new atheism became part of the zeitgeist, a well-timed reaction against religious fundamentalism. Okay. I object to always being uh, uh, to it always being implied that Dawkins, Harris, and Hitchens are the leaders of the atheist movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, they happen to be the ones who get on TV all the time. Uh, but there are a ton of uh, very intelligent, skeptical voices out there in the world, um, and. For, you, you, the idea that they are leaders of the movement is in some way and it seems like an attempt to imply that they are that they are kind of unassailable popes of the religion, yeah, which I have to of, remind people all the time we don't have. Or at the very least, uh, sort of global ambassadors uh, of atheism who are, you know, dictating a party line for the rest of us to follow. I can understand. Well, actually, I can't. I mean, it, it, yes, ten years ago. They were among the very first prominent public figures uh, who were known for speaking publicly about atheism and for normalizing and popularizing atheism among the public at large. Right. But it's been a long, well, actually, yeah, it's been a long decade since then. What was it? And the God Delusion was 2006. Yeah. And we're in 2015. Something and in that they? time, that there has been an evolution of whatever you want to call it movement atheism or just the communi community of atheism at large. And there is no atheist community. There are atheist communities. Right. And um, it has since become a much more diverse landscape out there for atheism. Yeah, I agree. So, you know, so if, if in this day and age you're still limiting your understanding of the atheist perspective on anything to what is said by, you know, the same four dudes, you, you haven't really grown with the movement, I don't think. Right. And, and by bringing this up, this is not in itself a knock on, Rich, on uh, Richard no, Dawkins no, or no. Sam Harris or Bill Maher, uh, all of whom have said many, many things I agreed with and mm -hmm. cheered for. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, to throw out some examples, I've seen Richard Dawkins get in some debates where I was like, well, that was a weak-ass debate performance. <laughs> it doesn't mean uh, that, I mean, he is neither an atheist pope nor an atheist great Satan, despite what some people seem to want to imply every mm -hmm. time one of those guys gets criticized. Yeah. They're both people who say some good things and some dumb things. Because they're people. Like all of us. That's how people are. And, for, and if we're atheists and we're skeptics, we understand that we're fallible people. All, right. all of us, even the people we admire. But let's face this author's charge that they are intellectually lazy and see what he decides to go for. Let us do this, <laughs> Russell. Um, There's something missing in their critiques, he says, something fundamental. For all their eloquence, their arguments are often banal. 
Uh, excuse me, I, I skipped. Uh, no, this is fine. Uh, regrettably, they've shown little interest in understanding the religious compulsion. They talk incessantly about the untruth of religion because they assume truth is what matters to most people, uh, religious people. Mm -hmm. And perhaps it does for many, but certainly not all, at least not in the conventional sense of the term. Religious convictions in many cases are held not because they're true, but because they're meaningful because they're personally transformative. And new atheists are blind to this brand of belief. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> oh, you're, you're passing it over to me now with that one. Wow, well, I'm a, doing all the reading. It's a target-rich environment. Where do you start? Yeah. Um, <laughs> first off, I, it's, it may not be strictly untrue that uh, for some believers, uh, it is about the emotional uh, experience, the transformative aspects uh, of religious belief, that feeling of uh, allowing yourself to, to feel that, uh, to believe that you're being loved by some sort of, uh, you know, divine uh, fatherly figure looking down upon you, and this makes, you know, the, the, the big scary game of life a little less scary to play, as it mm -hmm. were. All um, things, all roles that religion absolutely does fill for yeah, a lot of people. Uh, but I would say that even among <clears throat> the believers uh, who receive, who practice and, and receive and treat their religious belief in that fashion, I still think that, I don't think anyone of them would tell you, no, I don't care whether it's true or not, it just makes me feel happy and fuzzy. Um, they do think that they have tied into a, um, a transcendent truth of some sort. Yeah, you, uh, you even you if and they, I have talked to many, many religious people over the years, uh -huh. and I cannot think of almost any people at all that I've talked to who would just not say my belief in God is true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Some of them might be on the boundary of not be, you know, of not being a theist anymore where they mm -hmm. might say something like, you know, oh, you know, I want to hold on to these beliefs, but I'm just not comfortable because the more I look into it, I mean, those are people who are about to come to become atheists. <laughs> yeah. Those aren't your typical religious person. Your typical religious person who calls in says there's a God. Yeah. That's a true thing for them. Yes. And even when you hear, I mean, even when you're arguing with, with unsophisticated believers, um, you know, online or something like that, even mm -hmm. those folks will uh, immediately come at you with these apologetics that, again, they're receiving from whatever websites or, or, or um, ministers they're listening to that make truth claims, right? right. So they, they all want they all try to education for it. They're picking up on the pseudoscience of guys like Ken Ham mm -hmm. and uh, you know Hugh Ross and people <clears throat> like that, and they always say, well, what about the fine tuning of the universe? And so they do think that they are the, not only is there truth to it, uh, but increasingly the apologetics line is yes, and there's even and science validates the Bible, and so they want to try to claim some of that validity. So I, 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 I've never in, good Lord, when did I get on this show? First time, 99? And I've never once uh, spoken to a theist who's just, yeah, who cares if it's true? It makes mm -hmm. me feel good. And you know, that's, that's all I like. Here, have a, you know, have a marshmallow yeah. with me. Now, know, the hug. interesting thing is no. it turns out next that the author of this piece is maybe an atheist or maybe he matches the definition of atheist but wouldn't subscribe to that label, one of those. <laughs> Well. But he says, uh, it's perfectly rational to reject faith as a matter of principle. Many people, myself included, find no practical advantage in believing things without evidence. But, Got that? Yes. And the next sentence <laughs> You know it starts with a but. Yes, which I'm is an atheist, but he's one of Beginning a sentence with a, with a conjunction, which yeah. you're not supposed to do, but you know. But even so, <laughs> isn't this, you know, again, back in, back in 06, uh, didn't, didn't Dawkins specifically talk about these guys in his, in his book? Uh, I believe The I'm did. an atheist, but atheists? <laughs> um, but go on with what he uh, says, But what about those who do? Is a, if a belief is held because of its effect and not its truth content, why should its falsity matter to the believer? Of course, most religious people consider their beliefs true in some sense, but that's to be expected. The consolation derived from a belief is greater if its illusory origins are concealed. The point is that such beliefs aren't held because they're true as such. They're accepted on faith because they're meaningful. Mm, no, I think he misses it. <laughs> Go ahead. I find this attitude way, way more condescending than we ever would be. <laughs> I mean, at least we take believers seriously. 
when yeah. they tell us that they believe a thing. Mm -hmm. We may say you believe that for bad reasons. Let's explore those reasons. You know, let's discuss whether your beliefs are well founded. But I would never for a moment say, hey, this guy is saying that he believes in uh, in God, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, really he's just saying that to make himself feel good. Yeah, I mean, what well, a jerk. <laughs> well, I, the more this writer, you know, accuses the new atheists of not understanding the thought processes of the believer, he just reveals with everything he writes that he's the guy who actually doesn't understand those things. Because this very sentence right here, the point is that such beliefs aren't held because they're true as such, semicolon. They are accepted on faith because they're meaningful. No, they're accepted on faith because believers have been taught to think that faith is a valid form of cognition, every bit as valid as evidence-based knowledge if not more so because you are receiving it from on high. Yeah. They see faith as a path to truth, not faith as a way of circumventing truth just so you, that you can believe something anyway. That may be what faith actually is, but that is not how the faithful see faith. Right. Thank you, Russell, for uh, that validation. <laughs> <laughs> You're a good person, Martin. <laughs> um, uh, if I, can, if I am going to throw this guy a bit of a bone here, a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the things that we do here are from people who are uncomfortable with uh, full-on embracing atheism because they feel like religion is, is maybe offering something like meaning and purpose in their lives. Mm -hmm. and that, that happens, for sure, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and... Uh, he is not entirely incorrect that uh, it's a good idea for atheists to work towards, uh, you know, filling filling the void that people uh, might feel yeah. in their lives by not thinking, well, I'm going to live forever, I'm going to see my loved ones again, and so forth. Yeah. Well, um, where, where he's incorrect is in thinking that atheists don't recognize those aspects of the religious experience. Right. Um, there are maybe some atheists who do not, but again, atheists are not a hive mind, right? Uh, I found that, um, okay, for example, there are atheists who are lifelong atheists, and there are mm -hmm. atheists who have come to atheism after growing up in a religious upbringing right. uh, from church attendance. Um, and, uh, you know, recently there's been this phenomenon among, you know, certain atheist groups, uh, you know, folks doing these Sunday assemblies or, yeah, sure. you know. Which and, is fine. And for the most part, I found that, you know, present company accepted, it, the lifelong atheists <laughs> are the ones who are kind of sneering and, you know, being very derisive towards, you know, the, these, uh, these little meetings. Uh, maybe. Um, but where, but it's the, well, no, there's a lot of derision. I mean, I read, I don't know the background of everybody who criticizes mm -hmm. them, but I, you know, my suspicion is that if you have never grown up in the church environment and with the sense of community that that brings, uh, then you are probably less inclined to understand perhaps what it is that people who did grow up in that environment <coughs> got out of it. Mm -hmm. So, but if, you, if you're a new atheist who came to atheism from Christianity and from the church life, you're kind of used to having that little gang of folks, right. you know, that little sense of whether it's family or just friendship or community or what have you that you could plug into every, you, you will miss that, you know, that human kind of interaction thing. And right. so those are the folks yeah. that the Sunday assemblies are geared towards. But I mean, and, even lifelong atheists mm -hmm. need social groups to hang around yeah. with. Uh, and I have personally found, I mean, you know, yeah. people often turn up their nose at the idea that you can, yeah. that you can have social groups based on the idea that there is no God. Ha, yeah. ah, what do you do? Just say, you know, there's still no God all day? Yeah. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> God. But, uh, you know, I have personally found that the people I've chosen to surround myself with, mm -hmm. uh, in identifying themselves as atheists, uh, to a large extent, have set themselves, uh, you know, this might sound a little snobby, but put themselves in sort of a countercultural position mm -hmm. uh, where uh, they, they reject a lot of the things that people uh, receive like moral authority by fiat mm -hmm. yeah. uh, or something like that. Or, or have philosophical discussions about what it all means. And I do find, actually, that people who have sort of a reality-based, science-based view of life, you know, mm -hmm. and, and talk about skepticism and stuff like that, tend to have a lot in common with me and are worth uh, being in my social circle on that basis alone. Right. Now, there are some 
serious creeps in the atheist movement. As you'll, also, you will find anywhere. Yeah. Um, but it's not like there aren't those in churches, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you tend to find them pretty, pretty hard in, in churches yeah. as well. But yeah, I, I would say that if anything, like these these Sunday assemblies uh, mm -hmm. are, are, are nothing more than a, an affirmation of Hitchens' challenge to theists, which is, can you name for me a virtue that is exclusive to religion that no secular person can experience for secular reasons? You know, so it, it, whether it's a moral virtue or any, any, anything that is, that, that is uniquely good about the religious life that cannot also be appreciated in, in a secular context. Yeah. So, um, you know, it, it's, uh, I, I wasn't around, we weren't around uh, for like the very, very first days of the ACA. Mm -hmm. um, but, but even, but back then it was still thought, you know, it was odd to have maybe like an atheist group or something like that. And I've heard tell from the folks who were around in those days that the very initial uh, meetings at the, the bagel shop meetups on Sunday morning um, were just a very small kind of timid group of folks who were kind of looking over their shoulder with one eye, you know, in case uh, you know, Christian commandos burst in the door with Uzis or something. <laughs> um, but, they never did, yeah. by the way. Yeah. But, you know, it, it, what we had grew into this social group and then it grew into this media outreach and, the, yeah, and then it ha has now grown into what it is today. And so, yeah. Okay, so there's quite a lot to be said for it. Well, there's but, a lot more to this article. Yeah, but but uh, um, I'm ready for calls. I don't yeah, know I am too. Anyway, I think uh, you've got the general message. We we disapprove of this man's yes claims. <laughs> we don't approve this message. Uh, so now we're going to talk to John in Ireland. John, hi. Hello, John. Can you hear Hello. us? Hi. Thanks Can you for hear me? Yeah, yeah, you're on. Thanks for calling. All right, how's it going, Russell? Pretty good, how are you? Not so bad. Uh, I'm kind of speaking on the computer, can you hear me all right? Yeah, we can hear you great, what's up? Yep. Uh, if you've got uh, the stream running in another window or something, you might want to turn it down before you talk. <laughs> I don't know if you're being distracted by that, maybe. No, I'm, I'm Christian. Okay. So, but I think there's enough proof in creation, you know. Okay. And if you read the Bible in Romans 1.20, it says, it says, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even the eternal power and Godhead. So people are without excuse. Okay. Did you hear that? Yeah. Yeah. Why do you yeah, think know. that's true? Huh? Why? Why would you think that's true? Why would I think it's true? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because creation proves it's God. How? Because you just have to look around you. A creator had to make it. Why? And, and <clears throat> well. Why? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, first off, what sort of creator and why would it have required that kind of creator uh, versus any other kind of creative force? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, the God of the Bible is the only creator I can see that could have made the world. I can't see any God of the Bible, so, I mean... <laughs> yeah, I mean, we understand that you believe all of these things, and that's fine. I mean, yeah. that's, that's the, the nature of... I mean, that's, that's religious believers believe what they're you know, religion uh, tells them to. But again, why, well, from our perspective, from our perspective is you were brought up in a particular set of religious beliefs and you accepted these biblical claims as part of that, you know, uh, process of, of being raised in this religion, of having it be part of your life, part of your background. Um, and you must be aware that there are uh, a great many religions in this world, including a great many denominations and variations of Christianity, and those, yeah. people, those people have read their holy works, and uh, they accept what those particular teachings tell them about the creation of the world every bit as devoutly as you would. So how would you, what exa above and beyond what the Bible tells you, what, what is it that you're applying that allows you to say, I've looked at all of these things, and I can tell one from the other, and I have a criteria that I'm using, 
to judge that this is correct and these others are not? I mean, have, have you really looked at these things in a way that you can perhaps put them to the test? You say, well, okay. Well, all the, the other religions, all the other, I grew up in the Catholic faith, mm -hmm. you know, at first. But I believe all the other religions are trying to earn their way to salvation. So, like it works. Islam too? Yeah. Okay. You know, you know, Muslims, uh, like for instance, don't believe that Jesus was ever crucified. Are they right? No, they're not right. Like you know, okay. Jesus was crucified. So they're so the other religions aren't all correct. They're you're just saying they're trying. Well, none of the other religions. Like Jesus is the only one that rose from the grave. Okay, but how do you know that Jesus rose from the grave? Well, 500, there was 500 people seen him, you know. How do you know any of those people are real? All, all we have is a book that says 500 people saw him. And we don't even have an well, account from 500 people. What we have yeah, is the, what we have years is the later. Claim. What we why have is the claim. Why, why would the Bible write that 500 people seen him? We have, we, well, we have, why would he have? Have you read the Quran? Yeah, I mean, the... What we have from the Bible is the claim of one man, Paul, who was not present, claiming that there are 500 people, 500 eyewitnesses to Jesus' resurrection. What we don't have are 500 accounts from 500 people. We don't know any of those people's names. We know nothing at all about no. them. You know, well, if, and if 500 people were to claim something and none of them were to provide any evidence whatsoever, even that wouldn't be good enough to verify the claim. But in this instance, we don't even have that. We have one man who wasn't there claiming that a bunch of people that he hasn't identified saw something. How is that a basis for determining that well, anything gospel, is said yeah. has been true? Well, see, every gospel tells you the same thing. Well, and the book of Isaiah actually predicted it was going to happen 700 years yeah, ago. Yeah, again, we understand that you believe all of these things. We've been yeah. through this. How is it that you're well, making the determination that what you're being told by these scriptures are true? I mean, are, are you just reading what's in the Bible and saying, well, it's in the Bible, therefore it's true? Or are you actually investigating and finding out, like applying any kind, is there any kind of method that you're applying to confirming well, what you're being told? And if there's well, not, why would you accept yeah. from the Bible this process of just receiving the information and accepting it and perhaps not, not, not apply that process to any other written work? Well, I have investigated it. Like, I'm, I'm sorry, I, say I again, John. I have investigated it. You know, mm -hmm. I, didn't become, I didn't become a Christian until the eight years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what changed Before your mind? I, I was in the Catholic faith. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, before that, you know, I didn't know whether I was going to heaven or not. I didn't really believe in God. I've been went through all the, you know, the rituals of the Catholic faith, but I had no. Oh, you're you're saying Christ. when you were a Catholic, you weren't really a Christian? Well, not all not all Catholics are Christian. Okay. You know, some unless, are. Mm -hmm. unless, yeah. Unless you know you're going to heaven, that's what Christians are called in the Bible. Yeah, okay. I, 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 yeah, but again, uh, we understand that these are all things you're believing. That, but we're trying to get you to, we're trying to get you to grasp a process called epistemology, right? Which is, mm -hmm. you hear a claim that is being made. You know, someone might say, "Oh, well, I saw the Loch Ness monster the other day." Well, how would you? I mean, do you just trust their claim on face value? Or do you want to, do you say, well, I need more information than that. I want to have some proof. Do you have any pictures? Well, no, my phone's battery ran out, so I couldn't take a picture. I mean, at what point do you decide to believe a claim you hear? And well, then when if... 16, when I was 16, I first read the Bible, and I told my brother, it says here you have to be saved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until, you know, seven or eight years ago that he phoned me up. He told me he was in a gospel hall, you know, and a couple of weeks later, he was saved, and I seen the difference in his life. What do you mean he was saved? He was born again. What do you, the well, saved. like, did he come out of he a was, womb a second time? What do you no, mean well, he I was mean, born that, again? Well, I know what he meant. He's, he, he, had, he experienced yeah, I mean, some kind of no, life he change. He had a born again experience, and I seen that he was a new person. He didn't okay. want to do the things that he used to do. Yeah. Like, you know, he, yeah. And mm -hmm. the both of us used to enjoy our lives. We liked to go out and have a good time. Well, you know, yeah, yeah. nothing seems... wrong with that. I used yeah. to drink myself. Mm -hmm. You know, it used, it used to get me into trouble drinking. Right. Well, don't do that. So, yeah, that's. 
Yeah. I, I mean, I, I have never accepted Jesus or become born again, and I rarely drink except, mm -hmm. you know, in, in friendly social situations that I've never gotten in trouble for yeah. being drunk. Yeah, so we're getting, uh, we're so getting this, back. This isn't particularly something that requires a belief in God, of yeah. course. We're, it's, well, interesting, it's, uh, it's interesting that you, 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 you're the first caller that we've taken, John, because this is actually, yeah. this is something that we can tie back into what we were, call, we were talking about before we took calls, which was this article in Salon where, where you know, they mentioned that atheists uh, don't really have an understanding of religious belief uh, in terms in terms of how transformative it is in the life of the believer. Atheists are too focused on, well, is this true or is this false, yeah. objectively. Yeah. But but we do understand that. We understand that it's transformative. But I think, uh, you know, if, if I were to ask you right, I mean, you do think that these beliefs you hold are true, right? Well, I've checked out prophecy too. I believe that the Lord's coming back soon. Yeah, so you, you know, so you do believe that in, in addition to being these wonderful thing, the, this this wonderful experience that has changed the life of yourself and your brother for the better, you're no yeah. longer drinking and what have you. In addition yeah. to that, you do believe that these things you're telling us about what you believe about the origin of the earth, et cetera, et cetera. You think that those are factually true things, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Matthew's gospel talks about that there's going to be famines, earthquakes, you know, unrest, and this is what's happening now. Yeah. You know, can you happening. can you give me like a fifty-year period in history when none of those things were happening? Mm -hmm. Like, is, is there the any the point in history where there were not mm -hmm. any wars or earthquakes or anything? But never with this intensity. How do never you know? <laughs> yeah, it's it's well, that, know, that's, it's that's a pretty happening. big claim. I mean, you know, and <laughs> yeah, I think the citizens of Pompeii would have a thing to say about. Yeah, it. I think <laughs> in your own home country of Ireland, where Protestants yeah. and Catholics were fighting each other like 50 and 100 years ago uh, over yeah. whose religion was correct, you could make a case yeah. that there was a lot of war back then, mm -hmm. but there wasn't any second coming then. You know. Yeah, well, they've been talking this, about the second coming, but one of the signs was Israel, you know, becoming a nation. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one of the signs that. Well, you, you know, realize Israel was a nation when it was written, so that wasn't exactly a prediction. Yeah, but yeah, but they you became know. a nation, like you know, they were they, became, they, had, they, they were brought back to their own country in 1948. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, yeah, but and the, the talks of the Jews are going to come back, and the Lord says He would come back to the Mount of Olives before the end. I, I just find it really interesting that in these Bible verses that you're talking about, they never actually give a time frame. In fact, there's some indication that the people who were listening to it actually thought that, that it was in their lifetime, in the, in the you know, first century AD. Yeah, I yeah. mean that's uh, one 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 part of the Gospels where yeah, uh, you know Jesus. Well, Jesus there there yeah. were uh, millennial end of the world believers in the you know in the year one thousand. They were like, oh well, you know the the digit just rolled over for the first time. It's time for Jesus to come back. Well, well in the Gospel, here we Jesus, are a thousand years later. And Jesus himself happened. tells the apostles uh, at one point, you know, some of you will not taste death before you know the kingdom. You know, well, uh, you know, of, of yeah. God on earth. So, you know, he, even in, mm -hmm. so there's reason to think if you take the gospels at face value that Jesus believed that, um, you know, his own second coming would take place in the lifetime of his followers. But that, again, this yeah. is all, all sort of beside the point where I want to get back to what I originally asked you, which is, okay, I, we understand that you believe these things and we understand that you believe them to be true. Yeah. W apart from the personal transformative happy experience that you have had transitioning to Catholicism, is there anything in, when you want, it's fine if, I mean, I don't think, I, I wouldn't actually say it's fine, but okay, I understand why someone would take those experiences as a justification for believing fact claims of their religion. But let's say you're talking to different folks. Let's say you're talking to guys like us. You now have a third party involved. Okay, so if you want to make a claim about something that, that your religion states as whatever the origins of the universe, et cetera, what have you, you're going to need to bring us something else now. Again, it's like the guy who said, I saw the Loch Ness Monster. Exactly. He may very well have, have believed passionately and sincerely that he saw the Loch Ness Monster. He could have seen a big, you know, branch rising out of the lake and, mm -hmm. and misinterpreted the distance or something, right? People can do that. But now if he wants to convince you 
he saw the Loch Ness monster. He's going to have to. He's going to have to bring more to the table, isn't he? He's going to have to like, no, look, I've really look at all this stuff I have to show you. He can't. I mean, presumably, he can't just say to you, "I saw the Loch Ness monster. It was awesome." You wouldn't. Be he can't just say that and have that alone convince you, right? So, yeah. what else have you got to show us? When you say, well, the, the God of the Bible created everything, uh, the, nothing could have been created if it weren't for the God of the Bible, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, great. We know that you believe that. What can you show us in addition to, you know, what can, what can, you, what can you bring us to persuade us of that sort of thing as a fact claim? Independent of how I, happy you are. Let him answer, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, a lot of it comes through faith anyway, but I believe in Genesis 6, it mm -hmm. talks about, you know, that the angels came down you know, and, um, you know, they the went with the woman, they had relations with the woman, and they produced giants. Uh -huh. You know, and I believe, that, I believe that there's proof of giants, you know. Yeah, really? <laughs> and I've, I've, I've looked into it, like, you know, and there's actually, pl you know, places still in the world that would prove that there is giants. Really? Belback in Lebanon. <laughs> I'm sorry? You know, the deep. Belback in Lebanon. What are you talking Have about? Have heard of it? Mm. Belback. So, so you believe that the giants existed because the Bible says they did, and you're going looking for reasons to support your belief in the well, that giants. Supports, yes, that supports the Bible because. Like, what what proof of well, giants are you talking about, dude? Well, the stones that was lifted, the, the stones that was used to lift there. Oh, Stonehenge the, was made by giants. That's the only yes, explanation. I believe, I believe it's true, and I believe. It's okay. Continued. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I the, don't the, think most people would go for that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I listen. I listen I, to Steve Quayle, and he does a big study in it. Steve Quayle. There's other people. Russ Dizdor. There's other people. What? If you look them up, that they've actually done it. Like if you check Genesis six giants. Did they find the study. giants? They have. Pr they have proof that there is giants. Yes. Really? Have, have we got some giant skeletons you could show us? Well, they have they have got proof of giants, yes. What what kind you know, of proof? Listen, uh, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, they, 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 they have got proofs because they, they have been like what? taken over, you know, uh, different places. In Peru, you know, Peru is one of uh, oh. supposed to be one of the places where they found, you know, the giant giants. skeletons, giant bones. Giant yeah, what are we talking about as proof? Yeah. Okay. You what? <laughs> Was that a yes? I didn't catch yes. it. Yeah. Yes, they have skeletons. Where can I yeah. see these skeletons? Well, if you look up the website, I would check the website. Like, you know, there's a whole, you know, there's a, there's a big website. There's, okay. You know, there's well, it's a good thing that up. things on the internet are always true. <laughs> then. <laughs> well, that's what, say. that's what that's what you would say. But I right. I would put the Bible and I would prove that the Bible is true. You know, <sighs> and when I look at okay. prophecy. You know, I mean, to it me sounds right. to me like you're starting in a position where you want to believe that everything in that book of yours is true, and so you choose the most favorable interpretation of everything you run into in order to support that belief. But the okay. point is, I didn't believe. I didn't believe seven years, seven or eight years ago. I was going on about my life until my, you know, until my until your brother changed his personality by believing something. Well, okay. It, it, he didn't just change his personality. He was doing good for others, right? You mm -hmm. know, and I ended up going to church, and I, you know, uh, it took me six months. So if I if I introduced you to an atheist who yeah. was was not a nice person when he was a Christian, but then started doing good things after becoming an atheist, would you say that's proof that Christianity is not true? If I introduced you to a guy who became a Muslim and started and like converted from Christianity to Islam and became a much nicer person after becoming a Muslim, would you say that's yeah. proof of the Quran? Well, that could never happen. Really. But you're not actually, saved. <laughs> you know, you're not actually saved by being a good person. You know. Okay, then then what you brought up about your brother is irrelevant. Doesn't well, matter. Is, yeah. I knew God had to have done it in his life because I knew my brother. I knew what he was like, and I've mm -hmm. seen other people the way that they've changed. You know, the God had to have done it. They couldn't have. Yeah, done but it you himself. just said a person becoming or not becoming a good person is no indication of the truth of their salvation, right? 
Well, it's not just becoming a good person. It's actually been interested in God and been interested in the Bible. I wasn't interested So people in who become Christian Bible. become more interested in God. Big surprise. Huh? <laughs> Mm-hmm. No, no. But I wasn't interested in the Bible, but, mm-hmm. you know, before right. this. I well, believe that the Bible says you're a new creation when you get saved, yeah. you know, what it yeah. says in John 3, 7. Yeah, and I get all that, but you know, we don't believe it, and there's nothing that you've said in this call so far that is convincing. And, yeah, I know I have a tendency to ramble, but let me try to give you the short version of this, which is that... We're going to wrap up this call after this. We understand that there is this transformative quality to beliefs, but just because something gives a person comfort, maybe improves their lives, improves their outlook on things, it might change their behavior, it still doesn't mean that the factual claims that are being made by that belief system are true. It simply means that embracing this faith has happened to have this effect on this particular person. But I know a lot of really mean, unpleasant Christians, you know. So I think that what probably happened in your life was that your brother went through a period of change. Religion may have been part of it, but ultimately the credit for him becoming a better, nicer person, I would say goes to him, whether, you know, he's willing to give himself the credit uh, or whether you're willing to give him the credit or or, or just pass it all on to God. I think that your brother just underwent uh, some change in his life that he knew he needed to go through. And, and did it, and is not giving himself perhaps fair credit for it. That's yeah, just my opinion. The point, the point of being born again is you know you have eternal right. life. We're not, it's no longer hoping. You know, when I was in the Catholic faith, I was always hoping that maybe one day I would get to heaven, but now I know I'm going to heaven. <laughs> okay. And that's what most <laughs> born again Christians believe. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. No. And from our point of view, that's you've you know, switched we, from one belief that's not true to another John, belief yeah. that's not see, true. John, anyway, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right. You know, we, we know. Yeah, we, we heard it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We, we last, last thought, and then I'm going to move on to another caller. What? what uh, get the last word in. You must be born again. Okay. <laughs> All Thanks right. for calling. Yeah. <laughs> uh Joe in Manhattan. Hello? You're on, Joe. Joe. Hello. Thanks for waiting. Oh, excuse me. Manhattan, no. Kansas. Manhattan. Yeah. Make the distinction, please. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, how's it going, guys? Pretty good. How are yeah, you? I'm doing okay. I'm doing, I'm doing all right. Uh, I was just calling. Well, I've been trying to call for a while now. Like, I just started watching the show a couple months ago. Yeah. Uh, Thanks for watching. Yeah, no problem. Um, I thought Matt was going to be on today. I had a bunch of questions prepared, but, you know, I guess I'll, I'll make do. And um, I took some notes, but I'm not a very good note taker. So That's okay. That's okay. Well, what's uh, your question? Well, I'll just go with the question I told the other guy. Um, why do you believe the Bible is not true? Uh, well, which part? It, I mean, it's... A, <laughs> well, which yeah, part? I, because, not because it's got people returning from the dead and walking on water and talking snakes and, and magic tricks that don't generally happen. Well, I, I, I mean, that, that is a good reason not to believe something. Uh, to be more, a little bit more specific, though, we, t- we, we understand that, there, that the human race has a long, long history of religious beliefs, of holy books, of mythical explanations for things. Um, uh, we see no reason to see uh, Christianity or the Bible as being necessarily any different from what people in different cultures have believed uh, all, all throughout history. You know, the Greeks, the Romans, uh, the ancient Egyptians, the, you know, the, the Asian cultures, uh, well, Indian I culture. I mean, they've all had their religions. We see no reason to think that this particular one, these, these are the myths of our culture in the same way that they all had myths of their culture. Does that, what, that, what, does what the actual religion are saying, does that matter at all, or does the fact that they're all religions just make them all wrong? No, they're not automatically wrong just because they happen to be religious beliefs. But I think uh, if you look at how historians determine whether something is true or not, uh, they look at they look for like corroborating details among uh, independent sources, and they also look at the plausibility of the claims. So, for you instance. Uh, so, that Jesus existed? Uh, what, whether or not Jesus existed doesn't really matter to me. No. Because, you know, have you seen the movie Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter? Yes. Okay, so Abraham Lincoln well, was... Know, but I know what it is. 
Abraham no. Lincoln was a real guy, right? Yeah. Every historian would tell you that Abraham Lincoln is a real guy. Were the events of Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter true or not? They were false. Mostly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, actually, there was some good working of real history into there. But uh, for the most part, the part about vampires was nonsense. I think we can agree on that, right? Sure. So, Maybe you might have your own I, type of hobbies, but, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, my point of view is Jesus could well have been a real person, but so what <laughs> if the Bible is basically Jesus Christ vampire hunter? Yeah. Because we know it's it's we we know that, well, you know just just because a person may have been like a legitimate historical personage doesn't mean that anything that is written in a particular book about that person or for specifically specifically a holy text, which was written with the intention of deifying that individual of of you know making making this person out to be you know a god man on earth or whatever happening you know, or building a yeah. religious faith That's around this person. Religion. It doesn't mean that all the things that the Bible claims about that guy's life actually happened. Uh, and, yeah. and we can, we can deduce this because we know that through, throughout history, for example, at the time that Jesus is said to have lived, it was not uncommon for people to have these kinds of beliefs, occult beliefs, supernatural beliefs, and apply them to many other people in lives. You can read books from Roman historians where they, they insert these kinds of occult and supernatural beliefs into their straight up history. So you'll, you'll read Roman historians talking about how uh, Julius so, Caesar, or, yeah, so, yeah. So, or, or just you know, some some Roman general was leading you know the the uh, the legionnaires throughout, to, you know, and then an eagle circled over his head three <laughs> times, indicating that the battle would be won, and sure enough, it was won. So people thought like this back then, and so if if there, if if so if, if supernatural occurrences. Uh, were being ascribed just to you know, Roman generals, why wouldn't they be ascribed to a, whole, you know, a, a, a rabbi like what, Jesus? What was wrong with what you just said right there? An eagle flying around somebody's head. I mean... Do, do you think that, do you think that, that uh, an eagle flying around someone's head would have actually been a supernatural a sign? From the gods? I feel like if the eagle flew around someone's head and then we won, I would be like, hey, remember before the fight when the eagle flew around his head? That was cool, right? So you, you so, I don't know if I'd write that but down. I, I mean, my point is, like, historians kind of have a higher standard. <laughs> yeah. Where they, uh, you know, they are willing to accept that some general existed and some battle happened, but they might take the story about the eagle and the sign from God with a bit of a grain of salt, you know? I understand, but those are the kind of things that, like, that's not even miraculous. That's just, do you believe or not? There's nothing miraculous about that. Yeah, so, I mean, but, even there, the bar is set pretty high. I yeah. mean, if you've got some kind of unlikely le event like that. Now, what do you think historians think about people returning from the dead? Well, I think if you believe that Jesus lived and that he didn't... Well, here's the thing. Lazarus, I mean, if mm -hmm. that guy... Yeah. If that guy died, you know, they're holding a funeral service for him, and now he's alive. I mean, to lie about, I mean, did, did Lazarus exist? Because if, if he exists, I don't know. He, you know, uh, I came back from the dead last month. Did people see this at your funeral? Did anyone write about this? Oh, sure. Lots of people. 500 people, actually. They, they wrote it down privately, but, you know. I wasn't one of them, but I completely believe Russell. You said those people aren't, um, what do you call it, uh, identified in the Bible, and I think they are. I mean, really? I'm not yeah. looking at it right now, but it says, like, who they are. I mean, you would I, say the same thing. Really? There's, like, a list of, there's a directory? I have totally never seen that. Of names? I've, I have not seen that. In not a list of names, but a name of a, of a, um, of a community. Like, if I said, like, you know. 500 people in Manhattan or whatever. Okay. Well, actually, I was in Manhattan, and 500 people in Manhattan saw me. Well, I'm here. That didn't happen. No, he meant oh. the other Manhattan. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no. I actually it was Manhattan, New York. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you see, the thing is, uh, but you seem pretty skeptical of what I'm saying now, and I wonder why. Because what reason would I have to lie to you? Yeah. Well, really, I just, look, this is the thing. Like, your whole, like, Abraham Lincoln story, right? Yeah. Here's the thing. Like, we, we know that's not false because we know about the real Abraham Lincoln. 
We know about the real Abraham Lincoln because it was relatively recent and very well documented historically. But so, I were, mean, so were the Gospels when the Gospels were written. Not so much. I mean, they weren't written until decades after Jesus died, and That's they were clearly long, written with an agenda decades. at that point. Yeah, I mean, decades is not for a historical document. Decades is not a long time. I just told you that I came back from the dead last month, and you didn't believe me. <laughs> the, the point is, the point is, we know. No one's talking about that though. Like you, you have yeah. to tell me that you came back from the dead. Yeah. So, but the point is, the point is, is the the people who were making claims of supernatural occurrences uh, about, say, Roman generals, to give the example that I just did, were doing so for contemporary. Were they were contemporary historians writing those texts for contemporary readers? So again, it, all of these things are relative. The amount of lapsed time between a historical text and when someone reads it um, has little evidentiary value in terms of if you, it's got nothing to do with whether it's true or not, just as uh, however happy embracing Catholicism and how, however life-changing embracing Catholicism was for you know, our previous caller and his brother, that still has nothing to do with whether or not the factual that's claims of saying, God. That's not what he was saying. He was yeah. saying he used to be a Catholic, and Catholics are not really what you should be. So he's yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I thought. Well, the point saying. is we're saying in, in, in attempting to, 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 to claim that these things that uh, believers believe have some sort of basis in fact, we quite often hear just irrelevant factors brought up, like, well, you know, the, these gospels say, you know, then the, the amount of time, or, well, it just, it changed my life, and that's great, but there are different standards of evidence still that you need to apply, depending on the, the magnitude of the claim, right? It has to do right. the extraordinary claim requiring extraordinary well, evidence. How yeah. right? extraordinary um, is the nature of the claim? Like, is, 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 is God existing, is that an extraordinary claim? Yeah. Yeah, I would think so. I mean, wouldn't you think it was extraordinary if it was another god not from your religion? Just, no, not, no, I, I'm, I'm saying the fact that, okay, let me go back to what people right. like to say. Actually, I'm, I'm really to sorry to do this yeah. to you, man, but, uh, like, we've got three minutes left, and I feel bad that there's not going to be an after show today, so yeah. I want to get to one more caller. Yeah, we don't guess I, we... <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it's a good conversation, and I would like you to call back another week. Is that okay? Yeah. If you can try to call back next Sunday, that would be great. That's, that's cool. All right. All right. Sorry. Well, I appreciate it, Joe. We really do. Okay. All right. I'll call you guys back. Thanks, man. All right. Uh, we got two guys from New York, and unfortunately, we're only going to be able to get to one of them. So I am very sorry. Uh, uh, wait. Who is it? Uh, James. James, you're on from Stony Brook. Hey, I'm on. Hey, yeah, here. you got two minutes. I'm sorry. Yeah, quick question. Okay. All right, so I'm an ex-Muslim here. Okay. And, you know, there's, a, there's quite a, a big Muslim community here at my university. Mm -hmm. And you know, I try to talk to them about my experiences, and they say, oh, you're, are you Muslim? And it's like, no, I'm not. So, and they just right. look at me with three heads or something. It's just like, well, why? Has the media influenced you? Has something <laughs> bad happened to you? Or it's like, like what? What should we do? Are you okay? And like, I need some advice on how to deal with that. Uh, I feel like this question is not that much different from people who come from Christian backgrounds and uh, and get hounded yeah. by people who want them to come back to their faith. Uh, and I don't know that there's a good answer to them. <laughs> yeah. Like, like I tried to discuss about religion. It's like, uh, like they come up with the. Uh, typical uh, creationist arguments, like, yeah, well, how sure. did everything come out in, uh, using the world? Like, how do you explain all the life and diversity in the world? Mm -hmm. uh, well, <laughs> if you watch this show a lot or read, uh, like, ironchariots.org, then uh, you should yeah. be able to f get familiar with the kinds of responses that you have to that sort of thing. Yeah. But you can generally say, yes, there are legitimate questions that people have because we're naturally curious about mm -hmm. things like origins and where did X, Y, and Z come from and what have you. But there are scientific fields of study that are dedicated to that. They're very complex and it's a very, I'd say, a much better and more honest <laughs> process than to simply say, I have now made up a God and that will be my answer to those questions. Right. And we're out of time. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thanks for calling. I'm sorry to the other people who are waiting on the line. Call back. Uh, that's our yeah. show. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank Just you. Flew by. Right, yeah, I know. Okay. I, I tend to prattle on. I'm sorry. It's a bad habit. All right. Bye. Bye. No, Bye. you did. Yeah, it was great having you on. Thank oh, you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.
El Royal. We need to, we need to, we sure do. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not enough. Uh.